Peruvian. No, thank you very much. I take the opportunity also to say hello to my friend Chiguri Koshi, and I like to thank all the help for these and other activities from the University for Peace and mm -hmm. the they are their university, but more than more more beyond than the Oyama University with other institution in Japan. May I just take this opportunity to introduce my colleague, Mr. Ken Inoue. He served as the director of uh, uh, democratic governance in Timor Leste. You know, yeah. I was there as a Kofi Annan's uh, special representative. And then yeah. uh, uh, after, after I left, uh, Mr. Inoue joined the UN mission there, but uh, he, and he also served as a director of democratic governance. Yeah. Hi, uh, Hi this sir. is Ken. Nice meeting you, everybody. Um, I'm right now in Japan and uh, working together with Hasegawa-san and Kumagai-san at uh, a Japan Global Peace Building Association. But also I have been working for many years with United Nations, but also for the JICA and other organizations. Mm -hmm. And uh, today I'm looking forward to listening to Kumagai-san's uh, lectures. Thank you very much. Nice no, thank you for for take here and participate today in this important lecture of Dr. Komayai. We could give one minute more and we could start. <clears throat> Well, I I like to start this important lecture from Dr. Naoko Kumagai about the Japanese thought referred to peace. And the University for Peace has decided to formalize the work in certain areas of peace and conflict studies relevant for the institution strategic development plan. In this context, the chair or the Japanese studies, and we prefer to talk about the Japan chair through its education research activities is dedicated to enable a better understanding on Japan and its society, as well as Japan position in the multilateral system and its link with various regions in the world. It also expects to contribute to the dissemination of the analysis and academic studies originate and published in Japanese and to the other regions, basically through our here, this kind of lecture and the work together with the orientation of Dr. Kam uh, Kumagai. The University for Peace was created 40 years ago by the General Assembly of the United Nations through the resolution 3555. The General Assembly gave a specific task, a specific mission to provide the humanity with an international institution of higher education for peace and with the aim of promoting among all human beings the spirit of understanding, tolerance, peaceful coexistence to stimulate cooperation among peoples and help to reduce obstacles and threat to world peace and progress in accordance with the noble aspiration proclaimed by the Charter of the United Nations. Japan, Japan is one of the most dynamic nations in the international community, within which has an important leadership in the role of peace building and development cooperation. The need to strengthen our understanding of this role in the contemporary world has not diminished. On the contrary, we need to increase our knowledge and our understanding of 
the foreign policy of Japan and their view of the development and basically how Japan looks the development and put in the center of the people. In that, in, 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 in that regard, the Japan chair will open an, an a space for reflection and research on their conceptual frameworks, operational mechanism, areas of application and evaluation of their implementation. The Japan chair will open academic space to share the Japanese research in areas of peace, reconciliation, human security, disarmament, and others. And we are very pleased to invite as a director of the Japan Share of our university, Dr. Naoko Kam 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 Kamagai. I would like to emphasize the importance of the work of Dr. Kamagai and their experience as a professor, researcher, which would make the ideal for this position as a director of the Japan Share. Their experience, not only in the academic arena, in, in the reflection of the political view and the think tank view through the Global Peace Association of, of Japan, we think is quite important in, the, in, in this role. For that reason, I am sure the different initiative will emerge with your leadership Dr. Kamagai and the link with the Blue Peace professors to Japan academic community interest in peace studies and conflict resolution in a broad context on ongoing international changes is crucial. To define an important line of activities in the academic specialization and your specialization and your focus in gender as a cross and transversal studies is the same as in the UPs. In that way, we have coincidence with what do you like to promote in your academic studies and in the Global Peace Association of Japan with the values of the University for Peace. And also, I'd like to thank the Aoyama Gujin University and the distinguished professor Chigeru Kochi for their special advice and the support for implement this initiative and facilitate the contact with you for offer this position. And the university is very pleased you accept. And today we have the honor to hear you in this inaugural conference. We will have a good opportunity in the coming weeks and months to hear and a short course and other conference important to understand better the view of Japan referred to the international affairs, the view of Japan specifically referred to important issues in the international system. Dr. Akumagai, it's a very, very pleased for the UPs to offer the floor for your conference. Thank you very much, Dr. Lojas. Good morning, everyone. My name is Naoko Kumagai. I'm very much honored and humbled to have the opportunity of serving as director of Japan Chair at the University for Peace. And I am very grateful to Dr. Lohas for giving me the opportunity for this inaugural conference. And I'm very much thankful for the faculty and staff members and students at the University for Peace and Dr. Kochi Shigeru who organized for all these processes so far. Now, let me begin my talk today. Uh, I hope that you can see the screen uh, of my PowerPoint presentation now. Um, uh, if you have any difficulties in hearing me, please let me know. Let me begin. The title of my talk is The Evolving Notion of Peace in Japan from War Weariness to Proactive Contribution to Peace. 
The notion of peace in Japan is well known as Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution. It pledges that Japan renounces war and will not maintain armed forces. Still, the notion of peace in Japan has been evolving over the past seven decades with the changing international circumstances, but within the spirit of Article 9. In this talk, I'd like to explain how the notion of peace in post-war Japan has evolved and discuss Japan's new vision for the role it can play in maintaining international peace and security in the turbulent era of multiple global challenges, such as nuclear and missile development, global warming, global terrorism, radicalism, and shift in the global power balance. The Asia-Pacific War, which started with Japan's invasion of China and attack on the United States, caused a tremendous number of human lives. After Japan's unconditional surrender, as announced on August 15th, 1945, Japan went through an array of drastic domestic reforms under the occupation of the general headquarters led by the United States. The Japanese constitution was one of the main reform items. Article 9 was drafted by the United States. At the time, Japanese leaders recognized that the proposed ideas of the renunciation of war and the non-possession of armed forces were quite unrealistic. However, eventually, Japan accepted the draft proposal. The Japanese people accepted Article 9, even while they felt saddened and shocked by Japan's unconditional surrender, as you can see in the photo in the slide. In large part, ordinary Japanese were utterly exhausted from the war, which was causing them not only hunger, but also the constant fear of bombardment. However, how to defend the country without any defense capabilities has become a more serious issue as Japan moved toward independence in the late 1940s under the intensification of the Cold War. At one point, Prime Minister Shigeru Yoshida, in the spirit of Article 9, mentioned that Japan did not have the right to self-defense. When Japan regained its independence with the conclusion of the San Francisco Peace Treaty on September 8th of 1951, as you can see in the photos here, Japan decided to be under American security protection, concluding the Japan-US Security Treaty right after the San Francisco Peace Conference on the same day. The US-Japan Security Treaty had the structure of asymmetrical US protection of Japan. While Japan was expected to increasingly assume responsibility for its own defense gradually, after independence, Japan established the self-defense forces in 1954, but it was strictly for defense. The basic structure of the asymmetrical US protection of Japan has remained the same to this day with the stationing of the US military bases in Japan. Simply speaking, Japan's post-war security was mainly protected by the United States. You can see the main locations of US bases in Japan on the map on the left. And also you can see more detailed uh, US bases map of in Okinawa in the picture. In the map 
on the right side in this slide. But simultaneously, it is fair to say that the spirit of Article 9 has become known worldwide and is perceived as the symbol of Japan's pacifism. Post war Japan's relationship with international society was based on economic relations. Under US protection, Japan could spend more on economic recovery than on defense. Consequently, Japan enjoyed rapid and miraculous economic recovery. This was also thanks to the international regime of free trade under the general agreement of tariffs and trade. Japan's economic relations with other countries included the obligation of making war reparations to the victim countries of Japan's invasion. Here you can see in the list of the countries which had this reparation and quasi reparation agreements with Japan during the post-war period, particularly in the early 50s and also in the 60s. War reparations were also intended as a form of economic assistance for the economic development of these countries in Southeast Asia. Japan started giving technological assistance to these countries when it joined the Colombo Plan as early as 1954. The Colombo Plan is a regional organization for facilitating socioeconomic development of countries in the Asia Pacific region. However, economic assistance did not easily restore the Southeast Asian countries' confidence in Japan. When Prime Minister Tanaka visited Indonesia and Thailand in 1974, Violent protest, anti-Japanese protest movement occurred in Jakarta and Bangkok. In 1977, next Japanese Prime Minister Takeo Fukuda announced the Fukuda Doctrine in 1977 during his visit to Southeast Asia. The three principles of the Fukuda Doctrine shows Japan's relationship with Southeast Asian countries. The three principles are as follows. First, to reject the role of a major military power. Second, to establish a heart-to-heart -heart relationship with Southeast Asian, country, Southeast Asian countries. And third, to contribute to peace and prosperity throughout Southeast Asia as an equal partner. During the Cold War period, with the intensifying nuclear arms races, Japan's distinctive stance was its non-nuclear policy. Prime Minister Sato announced in 1967 the three non-nuclear principles of not possessing, not producing, and not permitting the introduction of nuclear weapons in line with Japan's peace constitution. Japan joined the Non-Proliferation Treaty in 1976 and the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty in 1997. Japan has not joined the recently concluded Nuclear Ban Treaty However, Japan is making efforts for eventual abolition of nuclear weapons. Still, it will be a big debate about how Japan can really make contribution for nuclear abolition. With Japan's economic growth in the post-war period, the international community, particularly the United States, has come to expect Japan to assume more responsibility for international peace and security. However, Japan's security cooperation could not catch up with such expectations so smoothly. Japan, 
declined the request from the United States to dispatch the self-defense forces to the Gulf War in 1991. Japan did not feel it could dispatch the self-defense forces even for a humanitarian relief operation. <clears throat> it took a long time for legislation dispatching the self-defense forces abroad due to persistent opposition from the left and the majority of public opinion. According to an opinion poll conducted in November 1990, 78% of the respondents opposed the dispatch of the self-defense forces abroad. It was only in 1992, after the end of the, Cold, the Gulf War, when Japan legalized the dispatch of the self-defense forces for peace, United Nations peacekeeping operations. The Act on Cooperation with United Nations peacekeeping operations and other operations served to smoothen Japan's participation in United Nations peacekeeping operations. Beginning with participation in the UN peacekeeping operations in Angola and in Cambodia in 1992, Japan has continuously dispatched the self defense forces to diverse places. The self defense forces have also participated in international humanitarian relief operations, internationally coordinated operations for peace and security and international election observation operations. International humanitarian relief operations were conducted in East Timor, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Rwanda. After the genocide in Rwanda in 1994, the self-defense forces set up a camp in Goma, Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of Congo, to provide support in the areas of medical care, sanitation, water supply, and air transport. You can see the self-defense forces billeting area here in Zaire. And on the picture on the right side, you can see the medical treatment by the Japanese staff members, medical staff members for the victims. In the UN peacekeeping operation, the self-defense forces monitors ceasefires and reconstructed roads and bridges. Due to Article 9, Japan had stricter operational principles than other participants in United Nations peacekeeping operations. The five basic principles governing the self-defense forces participation in United Nations peacekeeping operation are as follows. First, the operation will be, excuse me, first, a ceasefire must be in effect. Second, the forces must have the consent of the host country and the parties to the armed conflict to be there. The forces, third, the forces must remain impartial. Fourth, the operation will be suspended anytime that the first three principles are no longer being met. And lastly, there can, only, there can be only minimal use of force and only for self-defense. Such strict rules often suspended Japan's participation in United Nations peacekeeping operations as in the Golan Heights under the intensifying civil war in Syria and in South Sudan with the sporadic clashes among the warring tribes. Still, Japan has been creative in making more effective contributions to peace and security by complementing its participation in the Un United Nations peacekeeping operations with economic and social cooperation. For example, the Japan International Cooperation Agency, JICA, created the host community support program in Uganda, as you can see in this map on the left and the explanation here. 
on the right side. Uganda um, has accepted more than 880,000 refugees from South Sudan as of 2017. The JICA helped increase Uganda's capacity by enhancing the country's socioeconomic development, such as the construction of roads, schools, and hospitals, and the provision of agricultural guidance. So this map data shows the information of health sector in Yumbe district in Uganda to show the integrated information on the population and the location of health centers of each area, together with the location of the refugee settlements of the administrative boundaries. So that way, JICA can know where to prepare medical and educational and infrastructural support for better acceptance of refugees and also for socioeconomic development of Uganda. Japan also expanded its security responsibility in its alliance with the United States. Far from ending the alliance, Japan strengthened the alliance further after the end of the Cold War. It did so in order to address new challenges, such as North Korea's nuclear and missile development and the rise of China. The 1997 Japan-US guidelines enabled the self-defense forces to support US operations in case such operations were necessary in the areas surrounding Japan. The alliance was further upgraded in 2015 as 2015 guidelines for defense cooperation. This is for a seamless, robust, flexible response, responses for Japan's peace and security in the Asia Pacific region. The security bills passed in 2015 in the Japanese diet authorized the self-defense forces support for US operations in the Asia Pacific region. It also had the conditional acceptance of Japan's right to collective self-defense. Japan and the US have also agreed to cooperate in space and cyberspace. Still, the security bills of 2015 met with some oppositions in Japanese society. Since the security bills approved the exercise of the right to collective self-defense, opponents were afraid that Japan would become entangled with America's wars and that Japan would again become a country that could resort to war, returning to the dangerous path of the pre-war Japan. Opponents complained that the new security bills violated Article 9 of the Japanese constitution. These arguments, however, overlook the current security situations surrounding Japan, not only the North Korean crisis and the rise of China, but also the complex global crisis of terrorism and global warming. Countries are interdependent on one another for security measures. No country can effectively protect itself alone. Most importantly, the security builds of 2015 continue to hold on to the principle of exclusive use of Japan's forces for self-defense and exclusive defense and Article 9 of the Japanese constitution. The opponents also miss the growing frustration of American people with the asymmetrical security cooperation, which has grown especially with the economic development of Japan. Japan has often been criticized as a free rider. Most of all, it is important for a country to have primary responsibility for its own self-defense. If you do not protect yourself, who will protect you? Surely, due to Japan's atrocious past, the Japan-US Security Treaty and the US military bases in Japan are thought 
as the lid on a bottle to prevent another military invasion of Japan. But such doubt about post-war Japan's pacifism almost disappeared in the 2010s. Surely, when Japan prepared the 1992 Act, Southeast Asian and East Asian countries expressed their concern about the dispatch of the self-defense forces. However, as you can see in the slide, Japan has gained confidence with the accumulated successful experiences of the Self-Defense Forces participation in UN peacekeeping operations and the official development assistance program based on the spirit of Fukuda doctrine and also human security. A survey conducted in March 2019 by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan shows the high level of confidence Japan now enjoys from ASEAN members. As this survey results show, 93% of the respondents in ASEAN answered that Japan is reliable friend and they acknowledge friendly relationship with Japan. And as a partner in the future, at the right bottom corner, you can see that Japan has 51% respondents rated Japan as an important partner in the future. Now, I'd like to carefully examine Japan's pacifism. Japan's pacifism as strongly expressed by the opponents against the 2015 security bills. It is natural that Japanese people are so afraid of being entangled with war. Since ordinary Japanese suffered direct experiences of armed combat, such as aerial bombardment, naval gunfire, and traffic from low-flying aircraft. In the Tokyo Air Raid, on March 10, 1945, approximately 100,000 people were killed. The most striking experiences are the atomic bombing over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, in which almost 200,000 people were killed in 1945 alone. In post-war Japan, peace education has been passed down from generation to generation with stories of the Japanese people and soldiers. Such experiences were told to children, not only in classrooms, but also through movies, animation, manga, biographies, and survivors telling. Consequently, a strong sense of war weariness and anti-militarism exists in Japan. However, I'd like to propose that such pacifism is nothing but war weariness. War, wearism, war, war weariness, a wish to avoid harm being inflicted on oneself. It is not genuine pacifism because it lacks any thought on how to prevent war and how to construct peace. In other words, Japan's pacifism lacks thought on the reasons why Japan resorted to war, what wartime Japan did abroad, and how Asian people outside of Japan suffered from Japan's invasion and aerial bombing. Many Japanese know the Tokyo area bombing, as you can see in the map, uh, in the picture on the left side in this slide, but few Japanese know about Japan's area bombings over Chongqing in China in the 1930s. The picture on the right side show this Japanese bombing over Chongqing. Simply speaking, Japan's pacifism is self-centered and passive. It is nothing but war weariness. 
Japan is in the process of finding the best way of contributing to international peace and security while constructively learning lessons from the past. A distinctive principle has been formulated. It, has, it is the notion of proactive contribution to peace. The notion of proactive contribution to peace indicates that Japan seeks peace under the principle of international multilateral cooperation through stability, economic prosperity, and the value of human rights, liberalism, and the rule of law. It involves not only idealistic normative aspiration, but also pragmatic and realistic efforts. Thus, the principle of proactive contribution to peace runs through a wide range of activities of Japan. It includes alliance cooperation with the United States and multilateral cooperations with other countries in counterterrorism, counter piracy, humanitarian relief operation, and any other global challenges. And of course, United Nations peacekeeping operations and also economic and social cooperation through official development assistance with the spirit of human security. In pursuing proactive contribution to peace, Japan particularly pays attention to this principle of human security with the principle of nobody left behind and with the emphasis on the empowerment and dignity of each individual person. An important feature of the new Japanese vision is addressing pre-war Japan's serious mistakes. Pre-war Japan discarded multilateralism, transformed itself into a challenger to the international order of the post-World War I period and advanced along the road to war. Anytime any wartime Japan committed atrocities against people in Asia, Japan today is very conscious of the importance of not making any similar mistakes. Therefore, multilateralism is very important. In pursuing proactive contribution to peace, Japan has another subject. It is reconciliation. Japan still has the issue of historical reconciliation with neighbors, particularly South Korea and China. Some revisionists in Japan deny the 1931 Manchurian incident as invasion and the Nanjing massacre. Repeated apologies from the Japanese government while necessarily leading to the enhancement of confidence of Japan on the part of other countries created the sense of apology fatigue on the part of ordinary Japanese. Diplomatic efforts for reconciliation were often paralyzed by a strong sense of nationalism in both Japan and the victim countries. Japanese political leaders have recently strengthened the efforts for reconciliation. It is not just about making apologies, but also clearly recognizing what Japan did in the past, including its colonial rule over the Chosun Peninsula and Taiwan and its military invasion. Statements issued by former prime ministers, Marayama, Khan and Abe show such clear acknowledgement. You can see the apology for colonialism by prime minister Naoto Khan in 2010 and also the Japan's stance to squarely face the history of the past and the responsibility to inherit the past, as stated by Prime Minister Abe, Shinzo Abe in 2015. Reconciliation has definitely been, make, been making progress. Former adversaries and victims of Japan's wartime actions made efforts at reconciliation and accepting Japan's re-entry into the international community since the 1950s. 
And in 2016, as you can see in the two photos here, US President Obama visited Hiroshima while Mr. Abe, Prime Minister Abe, visited Pearl Harbor, the place where Japan attacked America in 1940, 1941. Still, it is fair to say that Japan's path towards reconciliation with neighboring countries is still in progress. Reconciliation is a process of continuous and patient efforts of building mutual confidence. Japan cannot accomplish it with a single statement of a prime minister, with more embedded individual voices of the victims coming forward in the 21st century, transnational and continuous reconciliation, as well as diplomatic effort has become more important than ever. In conclusion, for approximately 150 years since the Meiji Restoration, Japan has gone through diverse experiences in international society with both successes and failures. Japan was a late comer to modernization, but it was the first modernized Asian country, but it made military aggression to Asia. And it was the first and only country to suffer the effects of atomic bombs. Japan succeeded in a miraculous post-war economic recovery. And Japan's post-war efforts have gained a certain degree of confidence from former adversaries. Japan now can and should fully learn from and utilize its rich lessons for proactive contribution to peace in the even more complex contemporary world with both its traditional and its non-traditional security crisis. Japan's continuous efforts for overcoming war weariness and for transnational reconciliation are very crucial. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Kumagai. It's a, a wonderful global vision of the Japan modern foreign policy and different impact of the heritage of the Second World War and the impact of the Cold War and how Japan has a view were put in the peace in the center and all the orientation of the foreign policy is thinking in how to achieve the peace not only for Japan but for the world. I think you put emphasis in this view and make a key important point refer to that. Thank you very much for, for, for your speech your explanation i think it's uh, your your powerpoint clarify in a very good way this global view i offer the floor for some of our our colleagues who participate this morning in japan this night in in latin america for for this meeting I, I, I like to, to, to take the opportunity, Dr. Komagai, to, to ask you refer to the new development of the new issues referred to the new geopolitics in the, in the world and the impact particularly in the area of Asia. The impact of the Korean Peninsula in that region and the view of Japan in the one hand, and in the other hand, the view of multilateralism of Japan and how to achieve 
the problems expressed in the new global context. Thank you very much, Dr. Lojas. Um, uh, as for my view on Asia, with particularly uh, attention to South uh, Korean Peninsula and also the multilateralism, uh, I'd like to first of all mention that uh, that's true that we have a very high sense of crisis about the situation in North Korea, partly because we cannot really get the correct and the full information from the country. And then all the efforts, diplomatic efforts so far have not produced any uh, results in a positive way. What we have done, um, regional multilateralism and the universal multilateralism efforts uh, just ended up with the increasing number of missiles and uh, nuclear weapons in North Korea. However, and we also have the issue of abduction of the Japanese citizens. However, we tend to be very, very, um, narrow focused when we talk about this uh, today's issue of North Korea, but we should know that uh, we have not even opened the diplomatic relationship with North Korea. This is partly because of the Cold War, but more originally because of Japan's colonial rule over the Chosen Peninsula. So we have to really think about the issue of this Korean Peninsula in a wider, longer um, historical viewpoint. And there is some argument within Japan whether um, North Korea's economic sanctions, uh, economic sanctions on North Korea should be lifted before North Korea completes its uh, nuclear abolition. And Japan's official stance is that we should not lift sanctions until North Korea um, abolishes nuclear weapons. Um, however, I think we should continue some kind of um, uh, non-diplomatic or non-official efforts in parallel way in order to get some kind of connection with North Korea and then seek any kind of uh, non-coercive um, relationship, no coercive way of gaining understanding, mutual understanding with North Korea. And in terms of multilateralism, the we used to have the so-called six-party talk over the issue of North Korea, but it did not brought any uh, success. So now it's very important that uh, we have a more multilateral effort. And then as I mentioned that we have this um, UN United Nations economic sanctions on North Korea, but I repeatedly let me say that we should have another also route to get connected with North Korea to get some kind of breakthrough, even though it is very difficult. And in terms of, of Asia as a whole, uh, I think, um, as I mentioned in my speech, the rise of China is one issue. And I was actually hesitant to mention the rise of China as one of the challenges or threats. Uh, actually, China has a very historical uh, tie with Japan, a much longer than Japan-US relationship. And it is a cultural relationship as well as economic relationship. And even though uh, the new type of Cold War between United States and China has been emerging nowadays, but I believe that we should not make it as a new Cold War. It's very important for Japan to maintain a good relationship with China as well as with the United States. So in this way, in this for this, Multilateralism is very important. Um, and multilateralism in diverse ways, not only in security, but also in uh, economy and in culture. For example, um, Japan in facing the actions of China in, the, in Asia, in East Asia and Southeast Asia, Japan has recently formed the so-called Quad Security Cooperation System with the United States, Australia, and India. And that's for sure that, yes, that's a multilateralism. Japan is not going back to the pre-war Japan in terms of security, but that kind of multilateralism is not enough. We have to also figure out the common issues, common crises and common purposes and benefits we share with China, such as global warming crisis, and also economic trade relationship, 
and also cultural ties. So we can and we should explore that these areas of multilateral cooperation with China. Um, so even though I talk about the threat of China, the rise of China and multilateralism, I would say that that should be more um, discussed in a more subtle way. I mean, multilateralism in security arena might create another cleavage. We should prevent that. That these are my general views on Asia now. So, thank you very much, Dr. Kumagai. Um, thank you, Kumagai, for joining us, and thank you for such an insightful talk. Uh, we really benefited from it, and it was interesting to hear Japan's journey um, in peace. Um, I'm a professor in the Peace and Conflict Studies Department uh, at UPS, and I was wondering um, what are your thoughts on um, uh, you know, the, the, the pathway that Japan has adopted in moving towards, uh, you know, focusing more on human security and positive peace. Uh, how do you think developing countries which are more uh, occupied uh, even now with security threats on their borders and uh, they're still strengthening their military to deal with those issues, what lessons do you think they can learn from the context of Japan in moving more towards um, focusing on human security? Um, I'm, I'm not so sure whether I catch your questions correctly, but let me answer. Uh, if I'm wrong, please let me know. Um, in terms of uh, uh, Japan's assistance for developing countries in terms of human security, uh, we tend to have this, particularly in the 80s, we had this in Asia that, I mean, economy first and the human rights later. And, uh, but we have learned the lesson that both are equally important and both should be um, um, realized um, simultaneously. And then it's possible to realize both simultaneously. And actually, uh, economic development without human security cannot be a really sustainable economic development. Economic development, social development without human security just can create another larger inequality among people in the country. And then further I mean, deterioration in democracy, which creates another round of insecurity in the country. So it is a, it can be a vicious cycle of um, failure in de development and social instability, sometimes even internal conflict. Therefore, um, in Japan's uh, official development assistance, uh, we also, not only economic aid, but we also pay attention to the social cooperation in terms of education and legal court and the training of the judges and prosecutors and lawyers. And we also have the wider cooperation in public health. So um, it is a really um, the quite a wide uh, spectrum of governance um, arenas uh, covered by Japan's uh, cooperation or so-called assistance for developing countries. So uh, I wonder if this uh, really address your question. Um, sort of, yes. I was more thinking about how, you know, developing countries themselves, such as uh, Pakistan, where I uh, come from, you know, we're always thinking of strengthening our military strength, right? Uh, we're always thinking of war, always thinking of how do we secure our borders. So we are very obsessed with, with that security paradigm, right? So I was more thinking of how should we even change that discourse considering the geopolitical threats we have um, and, and, you know, whether or not it's even possible uh, at this point to shift that focus. Um, but of course, you know, I understand the, the contexts are so different from Japan to uh, that maybe uh, it's even difficult to draw those comparisons and draw some lessons. Uh, but, but yes, it's, I, I think what you're sharing about Japan and how um, the focus shifted to, you know, focusing on empowering the justice system more and other aspects of human security, I think that basically is the route to go. So thank you for sharing that. 
Well, thank you very much. Yeah, in, in terms of that, I mean, it's natural that uh, unfortunately we, we are in a regression that more geopolitical consciousness uh, across the globe nowadays. And um, that, I mean, we sometimes, I mean, geopolitics is a matter of prestige. And then of course it is a hard security issue. And people tend to think that the so-called military uh, to call traditional solution is the only way. And then, I mean, but that is not the case. We have more diverse uh, creative ways, measures, even to address the geopolitical problems. So I think maybe that's a new arena Japan should explore further in having cooperation with other countries facing uh, serious geopolitical uh, issues. Thank you for your question. I agree, thank you. Kent, please. Dr. Kent. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, I also would like to supplement some point about human security. Uh, what uh, uh, Kumangai san mentioned. Well, first of all, as he explained, it is really remarkable that for the last 76 years, Japan has never involved in any war. And therefore, Japanese self-defense, which is uh, quite big and strong, um, but we never involve in war and uh, their members never killed um, foreign peoples and they are never killed in the combatant. And uh, that is very good, remarkable point. But at the same time, as he mentioned, uh, this is very passive, okay? We don't want to be involved in conflict in abroad. That is the basic principle of the Japan. And uh, of course, this kind of concept has pros and cons. And uh, so in terms of the human security, as you know, human security has three aspects. That means freedom from fear, freedom from wants, and freedom to live in dignity. And Japan's main focus is really in freedom from wants. That is our approach. And we are very, very positive, uh, you know, to eradicate the poverty and all the social problems in other developing countries. And the Japan's already achieved a lot. On the other hand, freedom from fear, not so much. We don't want to be directly involved in. As he explained, the maximum what we did is through the peacekeeping operations in the post-conflict areas. For me, in my opinion, the worst case is the last one, freedom to live in dignity. Well, the concept of dignity is very broad, but as you know, usually it means how to protect and promote human rights and democratic values. In that sense, Japan itself is okay. We are more or less democratic countries, more or less human rights are well protected inside the country. However, we are very much indifferent what's happening in other countries. We don't want to interfere. And still many peoples believe human rights and the democratic value is some kind of the internal issues. Although a Japanese constitution and the national security plan and all other document beautifully mentions the importance of the universal values. However, as a matter of fact, our assistance to the other country is really focusing on the freedom from wants and not for the freedom to live in dignity. That causes a lot of problems for the current issues in other countries, including China, Cambodia, Myanmar, as well as many other countries which has the authoritarian regime. So I just wanted to very frankly mention, you know, uh, that is the situation of the Japanese assistance. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. <clears throat> May I just uh, uh, join in this debate? Uh, uh, just to uh, respond to uh, Ms. Rashid's point, it, you know, I have been to uh, Pakistan uh, several times. And uh, in fact, my uh, deputy uh, special representative in East Timor, he was the uh, chief of uh, staff for the General Musharraf, you know. And uh, I think when we talk about uh, human security, 
I think we have to also think about uh, the system, uh, political system in which that uh, society rests. I think uh, human security uh, concerns can be addressed very much in a democratic uh, society where the people, people can demand and that the national leaders have to be accountable to the people. And you know, where democracy uh, is practiced, uh, I think uh, national leaders has to, in fact, uh, look after the uh, human security aspect uh, for most. So, you know, you mentioned that, uh, yes, indeed, Pakistan has to, uh, has to guard itself against uh, possible Indian uh, sort of aggression and so forth. But uh, I think uh, nowadays, uh, this psychologist, uh, political psychologist tells you that uh, it's very much a sort of the problems or security threat is defined by the leaders, you know? Uh, so in the Pakistan that the military leaders they feel perhaps themselves honestly that they are threatened by India. But as I, as I sit from way outside, from far away from, uh, from South Asia, and I lived in uh, Nepal for three years, yes, India is a very dominant country. But to me, do, uh, India's intention to invade and conquer Pakistan is uh, relatively small, as I see it, you know? And uh, also in, uh, in the contemporary, uh, uh, contemporary world, I think Dr. Arahias earlier asked about our uh, perception of uh, Northeast Asia. It, yes, indeed, I think China China is currently very much in, a, in its very assertive role and uh, claiming its border areas. And we, we indeed see a threat from China, but is, is the extent of threat that the China is now claiming, I think we have to realist, realistically assess it. And I, I, if I may, uh, I think uh, one thing that uh, I'd like to add to what uh, Dr. Kumangai has said is that there, there has been a trans transformation taking place in the in, in, uh, concept of uh, peace in the Japanese uh, policy makers. I still continue to advocate the uh, constitution of Japan as a drawn up uh, right after the World War II. Conceptually, that constitution transformed the sort of mindset of the, of the people in approaching the peace. In other words, the Constitution Article Number Nine that uh, Dr. Kumangai explained so well rests on the on the understanding of the Japanese people at that time. Yes, Americans very much uh, involved in this, but uh, the fact that the Japanese Constitution is uh, still very much maintained is that uh, people people believe believe in approach. And Mr. Mr. Inoue mentioned that uh, you know Japan has uh, avoided involving uh, for seven years in any any external warfare. The preamble of the constitution, in fact, uh, transforms our approach to peace, and I I think that's what the, your University for Peace is in fact uh, teaching. That we we will. We, we have to transcend this Westphalia system of independent uh, uh, national states. The constitution of Japan said, yes, I think we should uh, move forward and very much advocated joining the United Nations. And in fact, in fact, 
to resolve, uh, uh, rest to the United Nations to resolve the international peace rather than us trying to, trying to uh, resolve this peace. We are now going backward. Japan is in fact pressed by the United States very much to join in what I find is a policy of containment of China. You know, China is seen as a threat and indeed China wants to claim its, its place as the middle kingdom. And I think they have to be restrained from that. But to do so by forming alliances is a militarily effective. But I find that the conceptually, we are not making any progress. What happened, what led to the World War I and the World War II? It's a, it's a war game, one state against another and the enemy of your enemy is our friend and we form alliances. And if it breaks down, then we will have a war. And now we are going back to, to that stage. So, so I think we, we should, we should uh, try to protect this basic principle that, that is enunciated in the constitution of Japan. Thank you, I, I spoke too much. Thank you so much for elaborating on it. I absolutely agree that a lot of it is uh, imagined by uh, the military uh, elite and military leaders uh, even now. And so that paradigm, that whole imagination needs to change. Thank you. You know, that, that, that in the Pakistan uh, generals, uh, I, I have known them. Their profession is to maintain their status. And look at what's happening in the Myanmar. The military leaders, they want to keep their positions and wealth. And if there is no enemy coming in from India or from China or from Thailand, they find the enemy in their own country to, to preserve their positions and wealth. So that, that's a human nature now. So I think we, we have to address that particular human nature uh, and that of the leadership very much. Thank you, sir. I think it's a very good view. Please, Adriana Salcedo, our director of the Peace and Security uh, department. Thank you, Rector, and thank you, Dr. Kumagai, for your insightful presentation. I really enjoy it. Um, a brief question, because I don't know if we have enough time to discuss in depth uh, more important issues, but I was wondering about how the agenda of women, peace, and security has been incorporated or not within the Japanese uh, policies in terms of, you know, uh, peace building, conflict resolution, and peacemaking. So that would be my question. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Saleto. Um, yeah, I didn't mention about the gender issues, uh, even though Dr. Rojas kind of introduced me as a the researcher I mean, studying on that issue. Uh, yes, we have the issue of the comfort women. And also, um, we made diplomatic efforts and uh, we made some kind of reconciliation with the former victims countries such as the Philippines and Indonesia, but we have still have some diplomatic stumbles with South Korea. But if I go down to individuals, uh, some Filipinos and Indonesians still think that uh, they are not really reconciling with Japan. So that's why I said at the end of my presentation that transnational efforts is very important. And then particularly this sexual violence issue is very touchy issue, very psychological issue. So it's not just that the diplomatic agreement or just a paper with some words cannot really heal somebody. So in that way, uh, Japan is also learning lessons that Japan should not make any mistake, the same mistake and also help to prevent the same tragedy happening in the world in the future. And Japan has been very, very active on 
the Security Council Resolution 1325, the very, very famous one, which emphasizes the role of women, the unique role of women for peace, uh, peace building. And Japan has planned and drafted and implemented the, um, the national plan to implement that. And also we train peacekeep uh, forces, I mean, male and female, for how to um, uh, communicate with local women. And also we provide some uh, trainings for peacekeepers uh, abroad. But some pointed out to me that this Japan's current effort um, in a universal level and Japan's reflection of the comfort women issue are not really linked. In a sense, Japan is working hard for this international efforts in contemporary world to um, cover up Japan's past. So in order to avoid that kind of um, perception abroad, I think we have more to do in the issue of comfort women. Thank you Thank very you. much, Dr. Kumarai. I think we have uh, need to finish because we have some time and announce for our colleague who participate. We're very happy with this inauguration conference from Dr. Kumagai, and we're sure under her leadership, the Japan share of the UPs will focus in education and learning process for all the public and also in private sector individuals, graduate and undergraduate levels. Sharing knowledge and best practice and try to learn more about Japan in that as today we appreciate for the, the question uh, and the issue arise starting your conference. Promoting broad under, undergraduate and graduate extension and to promote development and implementation of a series of training courses in different areas. Thank you very much, Dr. Naoko Kumagai. Thank you very much for your excellent speech and, and the, 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 the position. We had to opportunity to hear during the next uh, weeks and months, and we learn more about Japan in the global context. Thank you very much in the name of the University for Peace. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you very much for all the participants. I look thank forward you. to working thank with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Good day there and good night here in that part of the world. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.